When's the last time you thought about how you fret your guitar? Chances are you may have never thought about this before. Well, don't worry, because today we're gonna to take a detailed look at how to fret your guitar so you can avoid common mistakes and make sure that every chord and every note that you play sounds amazing and is buzz free. Hey, TAC friends and family, welcome to episode 182 of the Acoustic Tuesday Show. This show is all about bringing fun, focus, and progress to your guitar journey through my weekly Guitar Geek list, plus success stories from your fellow TAC members. Have you ever felt completely distracted by all of the guitar lessons that are available right now? It's okay if you do, because TAC member Stephen B felt the exact same way. In fact, today you're gonna learn what Steven did to break the distraction cycle and finally achieve progress in his guitar journey. You're not only gonna meet Steven today, you're also gonna get your weekly dose of acoustic news you can use, which finds us discovering a ton of new music, some new blues, some new folk, and some new percussive fingerstyle guitar playing. Yeah, it's loaded with good stuff. That's gonna happen near the end of the show. First, I wanna dig into how to fret your guitar properly. So many times I hear guitar players say, gosh, my chords don't sound good. They sound buzzy, they sound fuzzy, they sound muted. Well, today we're gonna to look at how you fret so you can limit those buzzy, crummy sounding notes and finally get confidence in how you fret the guitar, knowing that each note is gonna ring true and ring pure, just like angels sing. Let's talk fretting. Here's how this is gonna work. I'm gonna go through the three most common problems that guitar players have while fretting their guitar, and I'm gonna suggest a fix for each of those problems. If by the end of this, you've tried all three fixes and you're still having problems, I've got something else for you, but we'll get to that here in a moment. Let's go ahead and dig into the first problem. Problem number one is muted strings. This happens all too often. You're playing a chord and the strings that are meant to ring clearly are simply dull and thuddy. It might sound something like this. You might get sounds like that. The strings want to ring, but they simply aren't. So how do you fix that? Well, there are three aspects of your playing that you can address that would fix those thuddy muted strings. The first is your actual fretting technique. Make sure that when you're fretting, you're up on the fingertips, the very top of your finger. Now, this sounds silly and almost obvious, but a lot of times I see guitar players fret with the pads of their fingers. Well, if you look at see what happens to my fingers while I fret with the pads, they're actually resting on all the strings. You're not, those strings aren't gonna ring clearly. However, if you fret on your fingertips, you get great contact with the strings, plus there's room for those open strings to ring. And speaking of room for those open strings to ring, that brings me to the other thing I want you to take a look at. How much arch is actually in your fingers, okay? Because a lot of times I see players on their fingertips, but their chords still sound like this. They still get that thuddy sound. See how far away my palm is from the neck, from the edge of the fretboard? If I actually bring my palm closer to the edge of the fretboard, I'm introducing more arch into my fingers, allowing more room for those open strings to ring. A much better sound than this. Right, so bring that palm closer to the fingerboard you'll get a much better sound. And the final thing I wanna address when it comes to muted strings is playing posture. You know, a lot of times guitar players play like this because, well, it's comfortable, but that might not be the best for your fretting technique. So one of the things I would suggest is if you tried fretting on your fingertips, if you've tried introducing more arch into your fingers and it's still not working, try classical position, meaning the lower bout actually sits between your legs and the neck comes up at a 45 degree angle. When you play like this, it might be easier for your hand to maintain a more relaxed position and ultimately get clearer notes. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to problem number two. And problem number two is just buzzy strings. And this happens a lot. It can happen with single notes, it can happen with chords, and the solution is actually the same. And it's fretting location. So you're having these buzzy notes and it's like, how do I get rid of these buzzy notes? Well, you could be doing one of two things wrong. Number one, you might be fretting on top of the fret, meaning your finger is actually resting on top of the fret. That's gonna give you a very muted sound, real thuddy sound. 
Conversely, you might be fretting too far behind the fret, meaning you're farther away from the intended fret than you need to be. And that's gonna give you a real nasty buzzing sound. So what's the fix? The fix is to fret right next to your intended fret. There's kind of a sweet spot. If you divide the fret in half, go towards that, I guess we can call it the front quarter, right next to your intended fret, and that'll give you a buzz-free note. Not to mention, it helps you not have to push down as hard, which actually brings me to the next problem. The next problem I hear from guitar players when they're fretting is that, you know, my guitar's in tune when I tune it up, but then when I start playing, the notes seem out of tune. So what's the fix for these out of tune notes? Again, the guitar's in tune when you're not playing it, but then when you're playing it, all of a sudden, the guitar seems way out of tune. The solution is to monitor your fretting pressure. Check this out. I could be fretting the note and actually fret it out of tune. That's the normal note. It's a C note. It's the third fret of the A string. If I press too hard, listen to what happens to the note. I'm actually making it sharp by pressing too hard. This happens a lot with bar chords, and I'm guilty of it too. I want that bar chord to ring clearly, so I press super, super hard. What happens is it pulls the entire chord out of tune. So monitor your fretting pressure. Yes, there's a lot of fixes here, but ultimately, if you're conscious about your fretting motion, you can alleviate a lot of the problems, whether they be muted strings, out of tune notes, or just an overall buzzy single note. So you're sitting there thinking, okay, Tone, those are great, I've tried those, but my guitar is still super buzzy and things are wonky and I can't seem to fix it. Well, the solution, actually first the good news, it might not be your fault. Your guitar might simply need a setup. When you take your guitar in for a setup, they measure the neck relief, the saddle height, and the depth of the nut slots. If any of those three things are off, your guitar might buzz. You might have the best fretting technique in the world. Your guitar is still gonna buzz if it's not set up properly. So get your guitar set up. And even beyond that, sometimes you can have uneven frets and that'll, that'll introduce buzzing as well. So keep that in mind while you're off fretting your guitar. Make sure that you're using the best technique and if you're using awesome technique and your guitar is still buzzing, take it in for a setup. It might be time and it might alleviate a lot of headaches for you. Okay, now I have a couple questions for you. Number one, were any of these tips helpful? Were any of these tips helpful? Let me know in the comments below. The second thing I ask of you is if you have any tips, any fretting tips for your fellow guitar geeks, feel free to leave those in the comments as well. And the third thing, I know it's a lot, but I have to ask this. I've been thinking about doing a series within the Acoustic Tuesday show called Guitar Technique Tune-Up. And if I continue on with this series, what other techniques would you like me to cover? Again, let me know in the comments. I can't wait to hear from you. Now it's time to meet TAC family member Stephen B. Stephen B just celebrated his very first TAC anniversary. Yes, he has spent one year with Tony's Acoustic Challenge, and his first year didn't exactly go how he thought it would. Here's what Stephen had to say about his very first year at Tony's Acoustic Challenge. My first year wasn't exactly the best because I fell off for about nine months of it. I was on point for the first three months or so, but also was doing other lessons through another site and watching all kinds of videos. And not only was it distracting, it was leaving me without any real direction. I would pick up my guitar from time to time and would run through one of the scales from the 30 day challenge, but that was it. Coming into March, I decided it was time to come back and get serious about my dream of guitar playing. And I decided to stick with tack and drop everything else. This has given me some direction and I found that getting into the forums and participating is also helping with my drive. I look forward to a second tack anniversary where I was participating the entire year. I really appreciate Steven sharing this for a couple of reasons. Number one, he's kind of showing the nitty gritty of his guitar journey, saying, you know what? I had the best of intentions when I started, but distraction kind of worked its way in. And ultimately I found myself kind of bummed out because I was being pulled in a thousand different directions and not having any real direction. And this is the problem with distraction because Oftentimes it's disguised under good intent. We think, oh, another lesson, I'll just check this out. Oh, another lesson, I'll just check that out. Oh, check that, that's another course. And what ends up happening is the initial dream we have of what it looks like to play guitar, and that's unique to each and every guitar geek, oftentimes starts to get clouded because we see all of these other things. 
And what I absolutely love about Steven sharing this is he's saying, yeah, I fell victim to that, but you know what? I've decided to drop everything else and focus for one year to see how much progress I can actually make to finally fulfill my dream of guitar playing the way I see it for myself. So if you're out there feeling distracted, if you're feeling like you're getting pulled in a million directions, take a pause and actually reevaluate why you're playing the guitar and what your goal is and only focus on the things that will help you achieve your goal. So I just wanna say two things. Number one, congratulations, Steven, on your very first year at Tony's Acoustic Challenge. And number two, I also wanna congratulate you again because I think it's, it takes a big guitar geek to look back and say, you know what? Wow, I fell victim to a ton of pitfalls, but you know what? I'm gonna get things back on track. I love the attitude and I love the drive, so thanks again, Steven, for sharing that. Now it's time to hop into the Acoustic Tuesday bus, which happens to be routed directly to Kalamazoo, Michigan. And you might be thinking, oh, we're gonna go visit the old Gibson factory. No, 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 we're gonna do something far better than that. We're gonna check out a guitar snow from Acoustic Tuesday family member, Scott Earl. Here's what he has in his guitar snow from left to right. A Yamaha F355, my very first guitar, the one that started it all. My wife bought this for me about 10 years ago because I always talked about wanting to play guitar. It sat in the closet for three years, so she bought me lessons. The rest is history. Next, a Fender Telecaster, my first electric. In the center, I'm holding my brand new Martin 0016E, a Fender Stratocaster California series, a Guild D4 NT HR, and a Hofner travel guitar, which he purchased so it was easier to practice during his many international work trips. Huge thanks to Scott for sharing your guitar snow, and I love the story about your first guitar. The fact that it was kind of there and around, and then all of a sudden, your wife bought you those lessons, and it was like the lead domino, and now you're a full-fledged guitar geek, getting your guitar snow featured on the Acoustic Tuesday show. And guitar geeks, if you're sitting there thinking, I'm a guitar geek too. I'm just like Scott. I have a story just like Scott. Well, I want you to share that story. I want you to get your guitar arsenal featured on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. And all you have to do is follow three simple steps. Step number one, go to AcousticTuesday.store. Once you're there, pick out your favorite guitar arsenal shirt. Step number two, when that shirt arrives at your doorstep, go ahead and put it on and take a picture amongst all of your guitars. And step number three, head on over to AcousticLife.tv. And once you're there, click on the submit link in the top menu and go ahead and upload your picture and describe what's in your guitar arsenal, just like Scott did. Now it's time to hop into the Acoustic Tuesday time machine. Yes, it's a, it's a time machine that's, that's fueled by lost guitar picks and broken guitar strings. And we're gonna head way back to episode 178, where I talked about 10 Celtic guitarists that you absolutely need to know. That particular episode was just loaded with awesome comments, from artist recommendations to questions to just general guitar geekery. So I figured we should dive into a few of those comments. Now, this very first comment was one that I wasn't initially gonna feature because it kinda got my hackles up. But I read it again and I thought, you know, other guitar geeks might feel this way too, so this is something we should probably talk about. Here's the comment from Jeff Roberts. He says this, I couldn't possibly disagree more about the 10 minute rule. If you need to employ the 10 minute rule, you probably don't want to learn the guitar at all. What it does is it turns practicing the guitar into a chore. Have I done my 10 minutes? Have I done the washing up? Ideally, learning the guitar should be something you can't bear to spend 10 minutes not doing. The caveat being, as with all skills, you should always practice in your own way. Now, when I first read Jeff's comment, initially, like I said, is I, I just kind of got my hackles up a little bit and I thought, that's not very kind. But upon reading his comment again, I thought, you know, this is really valuable. This is extremely, this is an extremely valuable perspective. Because you might think to yourself, a 10 minute rule for practicing? I mean, guitar is something that I want to do. Why do I have to follow this rule for 10 minutes? And as Jeff said, if I wanna learn the guitar so bad, shouldn't I just practice anyway? Because I simply want to do it. And what I think is happening here, Jeff, is I think, I think you might be missing the point of the 10 minute rule. And I'm gonna use myself as an example. I make my living teaching guitar, playing gigs, and I'm surrounded by guitar all day, every day. And I still follow the 10 minute rule. And you might be thinking to yourself, why? That's kind of silly. You want to learn guitar, you teach the guitar, of course you should be practicing. Yes, I should be practicing, but I also have a wife and two sons. I also love to play hockey. 
I also have to run daily errands, and I also have to do other things that keep Tony's Acoustic Challenge going, i.e. run a business and do those other things. And that's where the power of the 10 minute rule comes in. Because all of us guitar geeks have the best intention, but life gets in the way. We don't just sit in a room with a guitar next to us all day. We have chores we have to do. We have to run around about town and do, and do whatever. Life happens to get in the way. That's why the 10 minute rule is so powerful. And that's why I, I strongly stand behind the 10 minute rule. Yes, I think all of us guitar geeks watching the show right now want to become better guitarists. I think we want to fulfill our dream guitar scene. But again, life happens. And that's why we lean on that 10 minute rule. If we can get in at least 10 minutes of focused playing a day, that ensures that we're experiencing daily progress. If you get more than 10 minutes in, great. If you have time to get more than 10 minutes in, great. But that 10 minutes a day gets you your daily progress, which keeps the momentum going. So Jeff, I wanna thank you for leaving that comment because I think the common myth is that, oh, 10 minutes won't make me any better. But I think the converse is absolutely true. I think 10 minutes will make you far better than fits and starts of practicing an hour here, wait two weeks, and then practicing an hour there. So again, thanks so much, Jeff, for your comment. I really appreciate your perspective. The next comment comes from Carl Curtis, and he says this, great to see you're choosing John Doyle. My wife, daughters, and I saw him live in Southside, Virginia, nine years ago, and talked with him after the show. A very gracious, friendly man, and in my view, the best acoustic rhythm guitarist in Celtic music. Plays a good lead, too. Uh, what an awesome story, Carl. Thanks for sharing that. And what a, what a treat to be able to not only see John live, but also get a chance to talk to him after the show. I, that's one of those moments that I think is, is so cool when, when, as a fan, you get to I don't know, share a little, share a little conversation with one of the, one of the guitar geeks that you really look up to, one of your quote unquote guitar heroes. So thanks for sharing that, Carl. I, I really appreciate that. Our next comment comes from Darren and he has a laundry list of Celtic artists for us to check out. Here's what he says. I'll go with the recommendations of Martin Simpson, Bert Janch, Dougie McLean, Ewan McLennan, Martin Carthy, Chris Drever, John Renborn, Nick Jones, Blair Dunlop, Davey Graham, Jim Malcolm, John Martin, and Nick Drake. What an awesome list. And Darren, huge thanks on behalf of all the guitar geeks checking out the comments on that show because you just listed some amazing artists that expanded that show's impact by, well, two times. Uh, I can't thank you enough for that. And again, on behalf of all the guitar geeks looking for more Celtic artists to check out, you did us a solid. So thanks so much, Darren. Our next comment comes from Ryan Knuckles. He says this, Great show as always, Tony. I joined TAC a few months ago and I've been recently experimenting with Dadgad Celtic alternate tuning. I've been mostly playing my Blue Ridge BR341 parlor guitar for this tuning. In your opinion, what tonewood combinations, guitar body types, and brands have you found are the best for alternative, alternative tunings? This is a really loaded question and I'll try my best to give a short synopsis on what guitars I like for alternate tunings. First, I should say this, Ryan, uh, welcome to the TAC family, and I'm so pumped that you're digging into dadgad tuning. And for those of you uh, that are out there thinking, oh gosh, do I have to have a special guitar to try out alternate tunings? No, just like Ryan did, he's using what he has, and I think that's a great first step, and it can kind of get you hooked on those alternate tunings and draw out the question that Ryan just asked. You know, what guitar is good for alternate tunings? I wanna start with tonewood combinations. For me, I like a, a, a top of the guitar that's very responsive. Uh, light to the touch, think European spruce, even Sitka spruce actually react, it reacts really well to alternate tunings. I'll even throw cedar and redwood in there because those tops are generally lighter. And I'm, of course I'm generalizing here. Those tops are generally uh, lighter and stiffer, meaning they have a much quicker response rate. And of course it depends on how they're braced. Uh, so I'm just, again, generalizing. So that's what I like for the tops. Uh, as far as the back and sides, I like a, uh, I like a, a, a tone wood that has a solid set of overtones that increases the sustain, that increases the lushness, because I think one of the things that alternate tunings do really well is it makes your guitar this, this resonant machine. Resonance machine? Resonant machine. It becomes very resonant. Uh, so what I like, I like uh, Coco Bolo, I like Rosewoods, um, Ebony, some of these harder woods that generally have a very musical quality uh, with, that, are, that are fairly rich in overtones. As far as body types, 
I prefer a larger bodied guitar for alternate tunings. Now things can get a little hairy because generally with alternate tunings you tune lower. That being the case, you can introduce a lot of rumble, a lot of uh, muddy bass in your guitar. So I say this with the caveat that if you're a heavy handed player, if you really like to dig into the strings, a larger body guitar might not be the best match. There's a lot of variables here, but for me personally, I like a larger body guitar. Think, think OM, think, think Dreadnought. Um, OM actually might be a little bit more balanced and might be a nice uh, fine middle ground. And then the final question, what brands do I like for alternate tunings? Uh, I mean, I'll just go by personal experience here. I love my Bourgeois custom OMSC for alternate tunings. It reacts so well. Um, fantastic guitar. My Martin uh, OM28 Marquee is another great um, alternate tuning guitar. My Martin HD35 is one of the guitars that I first started experimenting with alternate tunings on, and I've been wickedly impressed with how that guitar responds. And then uh, I'll also throw in a Larave uh, LO3R. That was the first quote unquote real kind of professional instrument that I had. And I had it uh, in alternate tunings quite frequently, and again, it responded very well. Very balanced, but also rich and lush in those overtones. So I hope that helps out, Ryan. What a great question. And of course, Guitar Geeks, uh, you know, you're watching. Go ahead and chime in in the comments below if you have any recommendations as well. And the final comment comes from Sato, one of our Japanese viewers, and, and he has an interesting perspective on the Gibson Kalamazoo plant. Here's what he says. Hi, Tony. I'm the listener from Japan you introduced in the last program. Regarding the Gibson Kalamazoo plant, which is going to be renewed as a hotel and visitor's place, I want the project owner to consider to set up a guitar-related showroom or hands-on premises where the craftsmen can show their work on making inlays on guitars, building guitars, or repairing if they realize it. I want to visit there in the future. I misread that. If they realize it, I want to visit there in the future. And I, the reason I wanted to read this comment is because uh, Sato, as as he mentioned here, he's he's commented before, and I just appreciate the perspective from somebody that may want to visit there in the future. I think you know a lot of times we think just in our own little bubble, and we're guitar geeks, and, and you know we're here, and we're we're kind of entrenched in the history. And and here Sato saying, hey. You know, if, if this becomes a guitar geek kind of uh, landing point where they feature guitars and you can see things being made, being repaired, being restored, I, I would consider visiting there. So I really appreciate the perspective, Sato. And again, thanks for, thanks for watching the show. I should say this, thanks to everybody who watches the show. Thanks to everybody who chooses to participate in the comments. I, I, I say this every show, but I, I truly mean it from the bottom of my heart. This community is, is top notch. And I love the fact that we can have respectful, kind discussions through the comments that ultimately help everybody out that watches the show. So cheers to you, Guitar Geeks. Awesome comments. And again, thanks for watching. Here we are at the final segment of the show, acoustic news you can use, also known as coffee talk, because I am fully caffeinated and flying high, ready to rattle off the news headlines from the acoustic guitar industry for you. First up on my list is Fender's Acoustasonic Jazzmaster. Now, let me describe the scenario. So I'm sitting at home, and this was over the weekend, and I'm looking at Instagram or YouTube, I can't remember which, and all of a sudden, I see my entire feed populated with Acoustasonic Jazzmaster reviews, which makes me think this is what happened. Fender distributed the guitars for review, and they said, hey, YouTubers and other guitar personalities, we're gonna go ahead and hold the release of the videos until such and such a date, and then we're gonna all release them at once. Well, they did this, and I'm actually glad they did it because it helped me stay in the loop. It was a little much because every reviewer had this guitar and I was like, whoa, this is a lot of videos. But I, I think it was incredibly well done. And I'll, I'll say this, my first initial reaction was, I can't believe Fender did this again. And that then changed to, I can't believe Fender did this again. Now I'm saying this as uh, an Acoustasonic Stratocaster owner. I think the Jazzmaster is really well done. From the offset body shape, which of course the Jazzmaster is known for, but the tones that this guitar produces are different than the other two models. You've got the Acoustasonic Tele, the Acoustasonic Strat, and now the Jazzmaster. And what I, what I think Fender has done a great job of is differentiating these three models with a different tonal set. And I will say this, I think the Jazzmaster offers the most robust tonal set of the three models. And again, I'm saying this as an Acoustasonic Strat owner. Now, I haven't had uh, the guitar in hand. A little birdie told me I 
may be getting one here pretty soon to do a review of. If that's the case, I plan on comparing it to the Strat version because I think it'll be really interesting to see how the two differ and just to kind of A, B the different tonal sets. So that's my plan, but of course, I'll keep you in the loop. Next up on the uh, the news list for today is a new song slash album from somebody that's been featured on the Acoustic Tuesday show before. Yes, Eric Bibb just released a new song off of his upcoming album. And rather than me try and describe it, Eric does a fantastic job when he did this little promo spot for Jazz FM. So with that being said, take it away, Eric. Hi, this is Eric Bibb here to tell you about a song called Whole World's Got the Blues my first single from a new album coming later this year. You heard it first on Jazz FM. This is a track produced by the fabulous Glenn Scott, who arranged an amazing session in New York City, featuring the legendary Steve Jordan on drums, the phenomenal Eric Gales on guitar, and the extraordinary Tommy Sims on bass and vocals. We chose Whole World's Got the Blues because in fact, that's what the world's got right now. This pandemic is challenging us all. But it's also a double entendre because the whole world loves the blues. So you got them. So now you got the skinny on Eric's new song, Whole World's Got the Blues. Let's go ahead and listen to a little snippet because he certainly juiced it up with that description. Now it's time to feast your ears on Eric's new song. Blues in the morning. Blues all through the night. Went to see my doctor She said everything's all right Still I can't shake the feeling No matter what I do Seems like the whole world The whole world Lara Vey Guitars is next on my list and I have to say this caught my eye. An incredible cephalopod inlay. Cephalopod? I think that's how you say it. Octopus. Okay, let's say octopus. It's an incredible octopus motif done uh, across the 12th fret. I think it spans the 10th to the 15th fret. Wow. Uh, amazing inlay done on a Larivé guitar designed by Wendy Larivé. How cool is that? Not to mention, so, so I see this picture and I think, oh, I gotta share this on the Acoustic Tuesday show. This is really cool. This is this cool intersection of amazing visual art and of course, performance art because it's on a guitar. And then I got to hear the guitar being played because you know I think the common, the common thought process is, oh, that guitar is covered in inlay, but does it really sound good? It sounds incredible. In fact, Larivé artist Matt Thomas is demoing this guitar. I believe this is his own personal model because he's a Larivé artist. And not only does this guitar capture my eyes, it captured my ears as well. And I'm pretty sure it'll capture yours. Let's take a listen. On to some more new music, and this one comes from Adrian Ballou. Now, I've featured Adrian's music on quite a few Acoustic Tuesday episodes, and I'm gonna do it again, because he's a guitar player that I look up to in a big way, because he has this surgically precise technique. He's a percussive instrumental fingerstyle player, and I am just wowed by his technique and his command over the guitar in its entirety, from the technique end to the composition end. And you might be asking yourself, how does a guy like this write songs? How does he come up with ideas? Well, if you follow him on Instagram, he's actually starting to leak out little ideas from his upcoming album. Now, I don't think he's set a release date yet, but just so you get a taste of what he's been putting out, here's a quick sample.
Speaking of instrumental acoustic guitar, Amber Russell, whom I've featured before on the Acoustic Tuesday show actually quite a few times, just received a new guitar from Gage Halland of Halland Guitars. He was one of the luthiers that I talked about on my once in a lifetime luthier list. Yeah, he built a guitar for Amber Russell and it is amazing. If you follow Halland Guitars on Instagram or Amber Russell or Strum PDX, Strum Guitars in Portland, Oregon, it's a great store, you'll get to see Amber picking up her guitar for the first time, her very first reaction when she opens the case. And I have to tell you, it just warms, it will warm any guitar geek's heart. It is such a cool moment to see her excitement, to see you know, her anticipation uh, to play the guitar. And I have to say, I was, so excited to her, I was so excited for her that I actually shot her a quick message and I congratulated her. And she was telling me a little bit about the guitar saying that it's actually a little bit slimmer than some of the guitars that Gage had built for her previously. And she said, it just is so comfortable. It's a slimmer design. I believe the waist of the guitar is pulled back towards the lower bout so it fits her better. And it's a fan fret model. Koa back and sides, I believe if my memory serves me correctly, Wow, what a stunning guitar and so cool to see. Um, just, just so cool to see two incredible human beings join forces to ultimately make music. Gage built the guitar, Amber's gonna play the guitar, bam, magic's gonna happen. I've got one more piece of news for you today. In fact, uh, talking about magic happening, what happens when you mix three amazing acoustic musicians? Flat did it happens. Okay, let me, let me tell you what this is all about. Tommy Emanuel, one of my favorite guitar players, somebody whom I've had the distinct pleasure to, to interview uh, over the last few years, an amazing human being, got together with Rob Ikes and Trey Hensley, who are also amazing acoustic musicians who I had the chance to meet back at the Acoustic Life Festival. Wow, I actually had the chance to, to sit down and jam with Trey back in the green room, which was mind-blowingly cool. All these three musicians got together and they got together behind Tommy's new EP, which is gonna be called, I just wanna get all my facts right here. The new EP is due out May 7th, so mark your calendars, and it's gonna be called Accomplice Series Volume One. And it's, I believe it's four or five tracks, including Rob Ikes and Trey Hensley on each. If, again, if my details are correct. They've released one song so far, it's entitled Flat Did It, and you gotta have a listen, here it is. to check out the full version of the song for two reasons. Number one, it's a great study in how effective call and response can be. Because at the beginning of the song, Trey and Tommy go back and forth using a G run on the guitar. The G run was coined by Lester Flat, hence the name of the song, Flat Did It. Well, they go back and forth and it's extremely effective in pulling you into the song. The second reason you have to listen to the song in its entirety is because it is three amazing musicians feeding off of one another, being completely in the moment. It's so cool to see, it's so cool to hear, and at the end of the song, I don't know who laughs, I think it's Trey, but that to me, that laugh just sums up what an incredible performance it was. So make sure to check out that entire song. You will be very happy that you did so. And on that note, yes indeed, the pun remains strong. I think it's a great time to wrap up the Acoustic Tuesday show. And I wanna thank you for joining me today, but before I conclude the show, let's take a sneak peek into next week. And oh my, have I got a dandy for you next week. Next week, we're gonna look at the 10 best acoustic duo albums. Yes, the 10 best acoustic duo albums. One of my favorite formats for acoustic music. Just one person and another person playing songs into a microphone. Yes, the 10 best acoustic duo albums is what I'll be talking about next week on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. And remember, you can catch the Acoustic Tuesday Show every single Tuesday on YouTube at 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Thanks again for joining me today. Thank you for being a guitar geek. And remember, your guitar success, your guitar progress, however you define it, is directly related to your guitar routine. So make sure you invest the time to develop your guitar routine and have fun every single day that you play. Thanks again for joining me. 
Thanks again for being a guitar geek. Cheers to you, Guitar Geeks Unite, and I'll see you next Tuesday on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Cheers.